be afraid to care Leave but don't leave me Look around and choose your own ground But long you live and how you fly Smiles you give and tears you cry all you touch and all you see, and all your life will ever be. Run, rabbit, run, dig that hole. Last your work is done Don't sit down, it's time to dig another one But long you live and how you fly Only if you ride the tide You're balanced on the biggest wave You race towards an early grave Taking away the moments that make up a dull day You fritter and waste the hours in an offhand way Kicking around on a piece of ground in your hometown Waiting for someone or something to show you the way Tired of sunshine staying home to watch the rain you are young and life is long and it's time to kill today and then one day you find ten years have gone behind you no one told you when to run you missed the starting gun Everything, everything's a bossa nova. Everything in the whole world, once you just find that pattern, man. And you run and you run to catch up with the sun, but it's sinking. And racing around to come up behind you again. The sun is the same in a relative way, but you're older. One day closer to death. All right, that's enough of that. We have a, this is a very, very serious stream. Obviously, very, very serious stream. We don't just sit around and, and play Pink Floyd songs as bossa novas. When when we do this, that's a very rare. That's a very rare thing. Hey, Marcus Aurelius, Tina, Karen, Original Crispy, Betty, Amos Ross, <laughs> loving your best life, uh, Chip, Bella's Patio Garden, <clears throat> Thomas, and uh, Derek here, we've got Felicity, and Mars, listening in from Louisiana, all right, Hugh, how are you guys doing? A yeah, bossa nova is a type of star. When a star goes bossa nova. Yeah, that's nice. Chip says Pete Canaris is very good at the bossa nova. Man, Pete Canaris tears it up on the dance floor as, all, as well. If you have ever been to an event with Pete Canaris, that guy is foot loose. Uh, how to garden? Hello. 
BDB75. Hello, Sarah. Hello. So, yeah, today we're going to talk about something that is near and dear to me. My collection of exotic tropical fish. I first started getting into collecting exotic tropical fish. I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about my train set. HO scale models are probably the height of engineering. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about my penchant for making traditional balsa wood paper airplanes. And if you're going to do that, the dope that you want, there's a specific dope to glue the, the paper. No, we're not going to talk about that. And we're not going to talk about my current obsession with plastic canvas. Did you know that you can make the most beautiful Kleenex dispensers with plastic canvas? Unbelievable. All right. <clears throat> no, we're going to talk about perennial vegetables. Okay. So, you know, the, the, the <laughs> David the Good is going aquaculture. Oh, yeah, that's all we do now. I've got lots and lots of pipes, lots and lots of fish. One day I'll get a fish to live. I can put that fish onto my dish, but until then, they're all floating again. Aquaponics. High IQ, stupid gardening. Uh, we're gonna talk about perennial vegetables. I first started to get interested in perennial vegetables when I discovered the concept of um, permaculture some years ago. You know, the idea that you, know, you plant things once and you have an ongoing harvest rather than having to tear the ground up and replant every year like we do for our annuals. Plastic canvas can do anything. <clears throat> I agree. Actually, plastic canvas is really fun. It's really fun to make little butterflies with plastic canvas. So, the idea between, you know, behind permaculture is it's permanent agriculture. So, generally, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of, a lot of people have grabbed the permaculture thing and, you know, like I sang the other day, everything is permaculture. Everything is permaculture now. Permaculture is hot, man. Everything is perma permaculture. And, and there, there have been times, you know, when I was younger, it was, I was pretty much all annual gardening. I grew regular vegetable gardens. I grew roots and I grew cucumbers and I grew beans and I grew peppers and stuff like that. But I really didn't do much at all in, in planting trees or any perennial vegetables. I, I don't even know that I knew such things existed when I was younger. I mean, perennial vegetables, it's just never entered the radar. And as I got into permaculture and I realized the value of planting long-term trees, you know, planting long-term edible landscaping, uh, I got I got kind of uh, excited about the potential for perennial vegetables rather than annual vegetables, and I would I would venture to say probably the the number one perennial vegetable, I guess you could call it a green, that anybody anybody would would grow as a matter of course would be asparagus. Asparagus is the thing. Asparagus is one that you you'll you'll regularly see you know at, at in in many more gardens than say you know good king henry or mexican tree spinach or whatever else it's just asparagus is caught on you know and became a thing whoever popularized asparagus it's 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 never going away at this point but as as i you know as i shifted into wow man this permaculture stuff is so amazing. I, I want to do like everything perennial. I planted up my whole front yard, you know, in North Florida with perennials. And I started planting the backyard up with perennials too. But then I, I had a realization. And that is some of the perennials simply aren't as good 
of some of the annuals. Hey, <laughs> thank you very much. Chip sends a, a one, two, three super chat. And then Chip sends a four, five, six super chat. Well, so who's going to do the seven, eight, nine? Anybody have a question? They absolutely, absolutely have to send a super chat for. <laughs> it's funny. Hey, hello, Ecocentric Homestead. Hello, Fern. Welcome back. Lord Full, Beth. God bless you, too. The Back Porch Farmer says, I'm about to wear out my Compost Your Enemies t-shirt. Good for you. I, I wear, I'm pretty hard on my shirts. <laughs> so, I started to go, you know, everything should be perennial. But then you realize, you know, there, some of the perennials aren't that great. They're really not that great. Like, you could force it and say, I am going to be all perennials because, because I'm a purist. It's like, you know, I'm not only a vegan, I'm a raw vegan. Okay. That's pretty hardcore, man. Well, I'm not only a gardener, I'm a perennial gardener. I'm a perennial gardener. <laughs> all right. Chip sends the 789. Ah, the 789. We got two 789s. Thank you very much, Betty. Thank you, Chip. <laughs> That's funny. Boom, boom. It was almost a jinx there. Hey, Raj. Thank you very much. So, so you look at this, these, these perennial vegetables. It's like, you, yes, yes. You could do nothing but perennial vegetables. There are benefits to perennials. Plant and see how they do. If they do really well, you basically incorporate more of them into your landscaping. You mulch around them. You don't have to turn the ground over. You don't have to do a lot of stuff. When you, when you have a perennial that's happy, it just goes on and on and on. These, you know, that's really nice. But, you know, tomatoes aren't really a perennial. Jalapenos aren't really a perennial. Cabbage, watermelon, pumpkin. I mean, I said in a, a, a stream Let's see, what was it, uh, maybe a month or so ago? Talking about the value of perennial versus annual. You, if, you plant, if you plant a chestnut tree, in three to four years after planting, you can expect your first few chestnuts. Ten years after planting, you can expect about 10 to 20 pounds of chestnuts per year. 15 to 20 years after planting, you'll be getting 25 to 50 pounds or so, or maybe more. Wow. Guess what? I could get 50 pounds of pumpkin from one seed in 120 days. Yes, it takes a little more work. Uh, you know, turning the ground over and all that kind of stuff. But really? Yeah, the chestnut tree is beautiful. Chestnut tree is excellent. Cool. But wow, is it really worth it? <clears throat> I think that the balance comes in a mix. The, the trees tend to be a lot more resistant to climate changes, to insects, to diseases, to a lot of other things. They're, they're long-term. You don't have to keep turning the ground and planting and replanting and all that kind of stuff. Yes, true yams are perennial. Hilariful says, rhubarb is perennial, but the leaves are deadly or something. Yeah, they are they could kill you. I don't think rhubarb is technically a food. I mean, strawberry rhubarb pie tastes amazing, but there is a lot of oxalic acid in rhubarb. I don't think it's a good thing to eat at all. But there are some perennial greens that are, are really worth growing. <clears throat> that are legitimately delicious, easy to grow, productive. Year after year, you've got food, particularly if you're a salad eater. I am not much of a salad eater. I, I basically, if I could just eat meat, I wouldn't mind that. If I could eat meat with, with some hot peppers and some herbs, and, and, and some tropical fruit, that's better. But salads, it's like, yeah, I'll eat it. 
I'll eat it if I have to. It's, it's fine. I don't really care either way. And I can make a really good salad when I want to. It requires a lot of bacon and feta cheese. And you just pile that up on top of the greens and you eat until you get to the greens and you throw the greens in the compost. And then you've had like a really good salad. Unsubscribe! <laughs> I hate this guy. He's so confusing. He's a gardener. He doesn't like to eat. Why does he grow that stuff? My wife says I just like to grow this stuff so I can look at it, not so I can eat it. But I, I, I am, I'm being facetious. Which, which I am rarely facetious. But in this case, I am being facetious. I, I, I don't eat a lot of salads, but, but I have everything I need to make a good salad if I feel like it. <laughs> And, um, and, and part of that is, you know, having the, <clears throat> yeah, Laura Phil says we liked arugula until we got garden beds filled with it. There's a point where you're like, okay, that's enough. But there's some things I really love. Asparagus. I love asparagus. It's very good. Uh, asparagus is a good, solid, delicious that's, that's a delicious vegetable. That is a perennial vegetable. So we'll run through some of these temperate species first, starting with asparagus. Asparagus, you'll often get these, you know, like root crowns. It's, it's a, like a two-year-old root that's been dug up, and then you plant that in your garden, and that becomes you know, your asparagus. It grows shoots. You get a, a series of shoots in the spring until uh, the, the shoots get thinner and thinner and thinner, and they, they become these beautiful ferny looking plants. It's a very nice uh, monocot. I'm almost certain it's gotta be a monocot. Somebody check me if I'm wrong, but it's one of those, it's one of those weird, oh, it makes a cool shoot from the ground and, and then um, it's, it comes back every year. But when you buy these, these things, they, are, they don't come in male and female. If you, grow asparagus from seeds, you will get male and female plants and they will set fruit and you'll get lots and lots of little blooms, which is kind of cool. And if you're in some place where asparagus is not ideally adapted, like, like Florida or the deep south, I highly recommend growing it from seed and then selecting and regrowing the ones that really do well in your climate because you can you can harness some of that genetic diversity get strong plants that grow from seed rather than relying on you know Mary Washington or whatever whatever cultivar happens to be the one that's for sale in in Home Depot or the garden center or whatever growing them from seed is not a bad idea and if you are in the deep south too uh, and, and up through the temperate regions there is a vine called Smilax which is a really close relative of asparagus and the shoots are very similar but that one you can actually harvest from the wild and find, and they sometimes call it greenbrier, sarsaparilla vine. There's there's a bunch of different species of it. Some of them taste really good, and some of them are a bit bitter, and some of them have really nice big thick shoots that are almost the size of asparagus. Particularly in North Florida, I used to harvest you know a pound or more of those guys at a time, and they were they were really good. I mean, saute them with butter and garlic, and and certain times of year, just go and harvest them in great big amounts and bring them back and, and cook them. They're, they're really good, but that's, that's a wild green. And if you find them growing, you know, a lot of people try to get them out of their yards because they are, they're really thorny, you know, as they grow. The young shoots, you could just break off and cook, but they're, they're very thorny as they get bigger and they're kind of nasty. But if you had a little bit of wild space or woods, I would totally not eliminate them at all. As a matter of fact, I would encourage them because they're such a good edible and you usually can get two cuttings a year. Um, the next one that uh, for a temperate, this is temperate bordering into tropical, this would be mild temperate, would be tree kale. Now tree kale uh, does, has done well for people in California and in some mild climates, but in the middle of a very hot summer like some of you guys are getting right now, they don't do very well. Sometimes they just kick off. My friend Curtis has grown them in, in Florida, and he gave me some, and I grew them, but I, I managed to kill them within a year. At the same time, I've had collards go for two years and just continually grow and make new greens like along these long, long stems, and they looked a lot like tree kale, which is a relative, you know. 
But the, the tree kale is a nice, it's a nice mild perennial kale, and in some places it's gonna do better than it is in others. So if you, if you have a chance to get it, it's actually a good vegetable as a perennial, and, and it keeps going up and up and up. It's pretty funny, it's like a, a long stick. Here's another one, it's called walking stick kale. It's probably very similar, probably even the same species. But that, that one, I, I liked the flavor of it. I just couldn't get it to correctly perennialize, so I'm guessing that a little cooler would have been better for it, particularly if you're in a little bit of a mountainous climate. Uh, I've always wanted to try and garden in Appalachia, like uh, you know Asheville, North Carolina area, uh, you know maybe over, over Knoxville, Spruce Pine, little Switzerland. All, that, all those, little, those little towns up there through the North Carolina mountains. Uh, I really, really like that area. The biodiversity is incredible, the soil is incredible, and the climate is cool and humid. Uh, it's almost rainforest, but it freezes. And, and there's nothing like it, it's gorgeous. But I, I, I have a feeling that some of these vegetables might appreciate that a little more than the 115 degrees in Florida. Another one that I, I consider a good, temperate, edible green, but some people are gonna freak out when I say it, is comfrey. I know people are like, comfrey has some sort of thing in it that makes you die. And I don't believe it. I don't believe that comfrey is dangerous at all. Talk to your doctor before listening to YouTubers. Your doctor's gonna tell you some nonsense. Believe him. Masks prevent the cur no, no, I'm not gonna talk about that. Demonetized! Comfrey, uh, I, would, I would regularly throw it into salads. The leaves are a little bit fuzzy, but they have a nice flavor, and I, I put them in there as an immune system booster and as an all-around tonic to give me strong bones in case I'm out chopping with a machete again, and I cut my fingers. Hopefully the comfrey actually helps with that. And comfrey is a really good medicine. I, I, uh, when I nicked my, this finger pretty badly some years ago, same finger I eventually chopped through with a machete. I, I, I have a scar right here where I cut into it once when I was cleaning up bamboo. And a nurse friend of mine said, um, she says, put comfrey on it and drink comfrey tea. Like, like when you bandage it, crush some comfrey and put it in there, wrap it up and, and drink comfrey, comfrey tea. And so I did. And it was a nasty, deep cut. It was swollen. I'll tell you, that thing healed so fast. I had mobility back. I've never seen a cut heal so fast. So I believe in comfrey. I believe it's actually a real medicine. And I think it's a, you know, in moderation, comfrey is good to add as a, as a vegetable. Just chop it up and throw it in some stuff. Just talk to your doctor first. <clears throat> uh, another one that, that's one that I really enjoyed when I was in a temperate climate. When I was in Tennessee, I was the yard with all the dandelions. Dandelions and dandelions and dandelions. And we would, we would chop, I would chop the, pick the heads, cut all of the yellow bloom part off or pick it out and then throw that into salads. And that's the sweet part of it. The leaves were invariably too bitter. They were, they were unpleasantly bitter for just eating straight. So I would take a few leaves and mix them into a salad as a tonic, but I, I rarely got dandelions. You know, people are talking, oh, dandelions are like lettuce. They're you know, maybe if you catch it at exactly the right time, they were, but in, in my experience, at least with the ones I had growing in my yard, they were always very bitter, except for the blooms, which were pleasant and slightly sweet. So often the kids and I would eat the blooms out in the yard. When the blooms came up, we would just pull them off and, and eat them all the time. It's kind of cool. And, and it was a fun thing to do with the kids. Of course, you know, the neighbors were always trying to eliminate dandelions from their yards and I was just loving the fact that we had dandelions. We, we probably seeded the entire neighborhood. <clears throat> yeah, permaculturalists don't make the best neighbors unless you also like plants. Another one that was, was really good for temperate climates are the, the wild violets. Have any of you guys ever eaten 
wild violets. That was a, that's a very pleasant little vegetable. Uh, it, it's, it's quite quite a pleasant. I mean, both the blooms and the leaves very non-offensive. Really good. Yeah, I would eat Bocking fourteen. No, not while filming the grafting video. I did not cut myself once while filming Get Grafting. People keep saying, wow, you cut yourself a lot. It was a joke. I bought an entire package of Band-Aids before I did the Get Grafting demonstration video. It's one of my more popular videos, Get Grafting. And, and I don't mention anything. You don't see me cut my hand a single time. I perform all these grafts and I'm using a razor blade, just a regular utility knife, cutting all of these little complicated graph, putting the little graphs together and showing you how it's not really as hard as it looks. Here, you just, you did And, and in every, every scene or two, I added an extra Band-Aid to one of my fingers. So by the end of the video, when I'm sitting there and I'm like, you can graft too. I've got like 20 Band-Aids on my fingers. So, some people thought I actually cut myself up. No, it was a joke. It's, it's physical humor, but it's a little too smart for the average YouTuber. And I know you guys aren't average YouTubers, so I'm talking about you, but it was, it was funny. Um, I thought it was funny. I know you recognize that Laura Full. <laughs> Comfrey is edible, yes. Uh, but I, it, it's so much funnier. Like, if you don't explain the joke, it's way funnier than if you, if you explain it. You know, you just, you just go with it. But anyhow, Violet's. Wild violets are easy to identify. The leaves are edible, the blooms are edible. And here's a cool thing. With my, my daughter and I, we used to make tea. We would take the, the violets and, and she and I, we would, we would boil some water and she had a little teapot and some little teacups. We'd boil the water and pour it over the violet leaves and it would make the most incredible blue tea. Just this beautiful blue tea, a lot like the the butterfly pea does that in the in the temperate or in the tropical climates. But this beautiful blue tea, and we put a little sugar in it, and we would sit and drink violet violet tea. Really cool. And remember that they're not the same as African violets. Don't go eating your African violets. I have no idea if you can eat those things. Probably not. But uh, these these are the wild North American violets. Just a really nice little little edible. So I would I would pick the dandelion leaves and the violet leaves out of our yard in Tennessee and I would pick a little comfrey and, and add them all to the salads. And another one that, that some people are not as familiar with is a tree. It's the, the basswood tree. Some of the basswood trees actually have quite decent leaves. You can you could just chop the young leaves and take them and put them right into a salad. The, the ones that we had in North Florida were generally too kind of fuzzy and fibrous, but they're not all like that. You know, um, some of the ones further north are, are very good tree. They call it, uh, I think they also call it the linden tree. So, you know, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> if, you, if you grow them, you could chop them again and again and get the leaves off of them. Just, just basically grow them as a... Um, as a, as a little bit of a salad. You could even make a hedge out of them and cut them back and use them again and again. Get the little salad base. And then I'm gonna throw two herbs in here, temperate species that I also found very nice to, as greens or for flavoring or for tea or for tossing into salads to just give that extra like, you know. And that is mint and lemon balm. Both mint and lemon balm are, are quite pleasant they're perennial, they take cold climates, easy to grow, and in just a little bit, they're both, they're both medicinal and delicious. So if you throw a little of them in a salad, you've got this variety of different stuff coming into the salad, and you throw a little of that in there. I guarantee you that the salads that you're gonna pick from these perennial vegetables are going to be more nutrient dense than, than a regular lettuce salad that you would you know, get, get bagged lettuce from the store or whatever. Just really, Nice, you get a little bit of the, the herbs mixed in with the, the different leaves. You can, you can pretty much pick a, a salad out of the wild if you know your greens well enough. The, the only downside is that a lot of those wilder greens have bitter flavors to them. So they may be good, but you know we've bred some things to be very, very mild and crisp and have no offensive bitterness whatsoever. 
like iceberg lettuce. You've, you've also lost a lot of nutrition in it, but it's a really good salad base. It doesn't get in the way of your, your hamburger, you know? Whereas if you put comfrey on your hamburger, you definitely notice it. Now, if we go to tropical species, these are the ones that I grew both in North Florida and down through, um, down through into South Florida, and I grow them here in the tropics as well. Katuk. You guys have seen Katuk. Katuk is a weird one. K-A-T-U-K, Katuk. It's got some other weird names, like, I think it's called Cape Gooseberry. Um, the, the Latin name is Syrupus Androgynus. It's pretty good. It has a flavor rather like, like, it's sort, it's sort of a, a sharp bean type flavor to the leaves. It's not bad. It's, uh, it's just, the leaves are not really huge considering the, the plant, you know, the leaves are only like that big. So, you know, you end up stripping a lot of the leaves and then underneath the leaves grow these berries, which you don't normally eat. And they, and, or they have these little hard blooms that it starts to make underneath and stripping that stuff off. They, they kind of, they're a little messy to clean and they don't make a, a lot of greens, but they have a decent flavor. And, and you're, you know, it's one of those ones that I stick in there, but it's not my first one. Like, yes, I am basing today's meal on Katuk. It's sort of like, oh yeah, I'm going to pick some Katuk since I'm over here. You know, it's like, yeah, it's okay. But it's not like a base. But the next one is a base. Well, to the garden you go And you want some greens for show Why don't you try the sweet potato Everybody thinks of that thing as a root But you can't eat the shoot Those leaves so green So there you go Like a spinach Sweet potato, when it's in your food, it's great. It's not just a root, you can put it in the salad on your plate. You can cook it, you can eat it raw. Every leaf that you saw on the vine, every leaf is just so fine. Sweet potato. Sweet potato leaves. You plant some sweet potatoes, even if you don't eat the potatoes, you can eat greens and greens and greens and greens. You can eat them raw, you can eat them cooked. Uh, I think they have a slight bit of anti-nutrients to them raw. I've eaten them a lot of times. They have a nice, mild, nothing flavor. But I have heard that they are more nutritious when you cook them. So if you cook them, steam them, saute them, whatever else, they're a little more digestible, better, better for you. Rather like the way if you eat tomatoes uh, that have been cooked, uh, a, a scientist friend of mine uh, doctor of botany I was I was talking with today told me he says you know he says it's it's one of those things if you you know you cook tomatoes they're actually better for you than if you eat them raw you might like to eat them raw but processing them is even better because it makes the he says it, it takes the lycopene molecule and it switches it it makes it more uh, useful for your body I was like well wow, that's cool I mean I, I, I had read that on the back edge uh, the, you know the package of ketchup but to hear it from a plant scientist was reassuring, because I don't trust the commercialism on that ketchup bottle When they say that bean is better in their product And I'm looking and thinking High fructose corn syrup, stabilizers, mono and diglycerides And then they have the goal Tell me it's better than a raw tomato. No, no, no. So, you know, take that for what it's worth. Some things are just better cooked. Edible leaf hibiscus. I'm gonna write this one in the chat. Abel Marcius. Man, a hot. If you can find this son of a gun, this is not an easy. 
Mark Watney. No, wrong potato. Sweet potato. But can you grow them in a greenhouse in Massachusetts? That is always the question there, man. Oh, boy. Can it, can it be grown in a greenhouse in Massachusetts? Tropical fruits <laughs> in Massachusetts. Edible leaf hibiscus, apple luscious manahot. It's really easy. It's a little shrub. Make great big green leaves. That is the one that is in the preview for this video. That is what I used uh, in the, the thumbnail. Just such a good vegetable, man. I mean, it, it's so good that if I had a greenhouse in Massachusetts, I would grow it. Because it is a very mild type of a lettuce. It's slightly mucilaginous, which some people don't like. I don't care. Uh, just a good green, slightly sweet flavor. Very much fills in the space of a lettuce or a spinach without the scratchiness of spinach. Spinach scratches my throat up. Spinach is not a particularly good vegetable. For those of you who are into spinach smoothies, knock it off. Come on. That stuff is so full of oxalic acid. It's like putting sharp crystals into your kidneys every time you eat it. That is not a particularly good one. Popeye was a shill for big spinach. Think about it. But the edible leaf hibiscus is really good. And being it's a member of the Malvaceae family, obviously, being a hibiscus. And then it has a cousin, the cranberry hibiscus, which grows from cuttings or from seeds. The edible leaf hibiscus grows from cuttings or seeds as well, but it's generally propagated by cuttings in more temperate climates because uh, it doesn't often set seeds there. <clears throat> the cranberry hibiscus is hibiscus acetosella. And the hibiscus acetosella, it's a beautiful hibiscus. It's just this deep uh, burgundy red leaves and almost a black red bloom about this big, like velvety, dark, dark red. Just a gorgeous blue. Really, really cool plant. And it grows into a little shrub. It's kind of a short-lived perennial. It's, it's not the toughest thing in the world. It tends to deteriorate over the course of a few years and die out. But often it's set plenty of seeds by that point and it's really easy to start new ones from seed. It's really easy to clip a branch off and stick it in the ground and have it grow. It's a little bit subject to mealybugs, so every once in a while you may have just have to light them on fire and start over with some new ones. But uh, unlike the, the edible leaf hibiscus, the hibiscus uh, abelmoshus manahot, hibiscus acetosella is very tart. So it's, it's not like the base for your salad, but you could take pieces of it and throw it into a salad and it's like an instant Caesar salad type flavor. It gives it this tart, tart, sharp, almost a vinegary flavor that is very, very nice. And being so dark red, it's probably good for you. But cranberry hibiscus is a nice one, very pretty. It can take cold down to about uh, it, you could probably grow it into zone 8, but you might be starting to look at, at growing it as an annual instead. In zone 9, it'll freeze back and then grow back. But in zone 8, it may freeze to the ground and die. It's hard to say. Some, and, and it really depends on what kind of a protected location you have. If you are in a zone 8 or zone 7, you can grow things that are a zone warmer than you by planting them on the south-facing wall of your house or in a sheltered location or in a big pot right in a corner of a patio, that kind of thing, you could get away with way more than you think. You may even be able to push an entire two zones if you have a microclimate that you can discover. Um, the next one that I really, really like for a, for a really good ongoing green, unfortunately, you cannot eat it raw, and that is chaya, Mexican tree spinach. I wrote about this on my blog. Uh, I've written about it in basically all of my Florida gardening books. Mexican tree spinach, you have to cook it. It's a relative of cassava. It's got a little bit of cyanide precursors in it. But that means that insects generally don't eat it. So that's, that's a benefit of having a plant that's slightly toxic raw, is that everything leaves it alone, you know, which is, which is cool. So the Mexican tree spinach, um, you start it from cuttings, it grows from years. It could turn into a big, pretty big tree if it's the there's, there's two forms of it. There's kind of a wilder looking type with really raggedy leaves that has a lot of little white blooms on it. That one attracts butterflies, but it's not as good to eat. It's edible, 
but it's really kind of papery. The, the leaves are just like, eh, it's all right. The better one is the maple leaf variety. The maple leaf variety is just uh, a very, very pleasant green, and the young shoots can be chopped up and eaten. Stick to the young leaves. The bigger leaves do get papery as well. But Mexican tree spinach, um, great stuff. Chaya, C-H-A-Y-A, if you look for that. Some people sell cuttings online. You, you won't get it from seeds. It's, a, it's basically cuttings only. You break cuttings off of it, you just let them lay in the sun. Cut, like, cut some cuttings off, let them lay in the sun or shade or wherever to dry out for a few days. And then you plant them somewhere when they've healed over and they'll, they'll grow new ones. Pretty amazing. Uh, we'll cover, I'm going to cover four more tropical greens and then I'm going to answer the super chats that I see coming in here. I know I got a few here. I'm, I'm not forgetting you. I just want to run through this. So longevity spinach is the next one. Uh, longevity spinach is Gynura procumbens. That is a really good one. It's got it's it's medicinal, and it is <clears throat> very nutritious. And it's kind of a creeping, shrubby little plant with with fleshy, tender leaves. Longevity spinach is really good. I like it. It has this good, nice, sharp green flavor that's not really like anything else. It's very very pleasant. I I find, and. It, it just fills in the gaps of a salad really nicely. And now I'm feeling like eating a salad. Just, just talking about it, it's making me, it's softening my heart towards salad to have this conversation with you guys right now. Longevity spinach is a really good one. You start that one from cuttings too. You just stick a cutting in the ground. It's a lot like sweet potatoes where you take a cutting off of the vine, stick it in the ground, it grows. Uh, and it has a cousin called Okinawa spinach, which is Gynura bicolor. That one is really pretty. It's got leaves that are green on top and it is purple underneath, like dark purple. Very, very pretty, but it's not nearly as aggressive or hardy as longevity spinach. It tends to be weak. When I've grown it, it's always been much weaker than the longevity spinach and it tends to die out over time. Whereas the longevity spinach just keeps going, you know. Uh, but Okinawa spinach has a less sharp flavor. Longevity spinach has a very green flavor to it that I like, but some people may not. And the Okinawa spinach is milder, probably a better, just a bulker to a salad, you know. Uh, and, it's, and it's also very ornamental. It's just not, it's just not as vigorous. You know, every time I've grown it, it's just been kind of like poking along. There may be some more vigorous varieties, but it seems like it would grow for a while and die out and grow for a while and die out you know um, the next one is is not is another one you probably wouldn't recognize generally as a good salad or perennial green and that is canna blooms not calla but canna canna lilies the relatives of bananas canna lilies yeah they have these big you know these big ornamental blooms the blooms are sweet and and kind of lettucey you could just Break those blooms off and throw them in a salad. There's no part on the canna that is poisonous. Don't confuse it with calla lily, which is poisonous in all of its parts. Canna lily is not. But the, the canna lilies, uh, they're just really nice to throw in salads. My dad brought a, a friend through once, some sort of an executive or something that wanted to talk to him about something or other. And this guy was interested in seeing our gardens. My dad wanted to meet with him somewhere. So he says, well, I'll go over and we'll, let, me, let me show you, you know, Dave's gardens and we'll, we'll meet up and talk. And my wife and I picked a bunch of salad greens. The guy said he loved to eat salads, loved salads. I said, do you want a salad from the garden? Oh, yes. So we had dinner and my wife made these salads and they had Biden's Alba in them. They had sweet potato leaves. They had edible leaf hibiscus, cranberry hibiscus. They had the Jamaican sorrel, the one that they grow in the, the Caribbean and in Thailand. Um, sometimes they used to call it Florida cranberry, but now it's generally just called sorrel because there's enough islanders that have moved up into Florida that it's kind of just become their thing. And um, we had, you know, I just, there, there were probably 12 different species or more in there, including canna blooms. And, and he just, he was like, this is a really beautiful salad. This is amazing, you know? And, and it was amazing. It, it's, 
I always figured the, the broader the range of vegetables that you're putting into something, probably the broader the range of nutrients that you're, you're getting. So a whole bunch of highly, you know, bright colored things all put together into one salad with, a, with wild greens mixed with some cultivated greens, you know, some, some kale from the garden and some lettuce from the garden, but then you've got some Biden's Alba, then you've got some longevity spinach from the front yard food forest, you've got some can of blooms, that's gotta be good for you. And then the final tropical species that we grew regularly, which is also a pretty little, it's a pretty little plant in the landscaping too, is water leaf. And I am going to write that, the, the Latin name down here. It's called Talinum fruticosum. Talinum fruticosum. That is a really nice little green. I think it's a little high in oxalic acid, so I cook it. In Florida, I found that I could just eat it and it didn't make my throat feel scratchy. But when I moved to the tropics and I, I grew it and ate it, it made my throat feel scratchy and my kids noticed the same thing. So it's gonna res it seems to respond differently in different soils. In Florida, I could just eat it raw but uh, i don't do that here now i cook it and it's it's a pretty little plant really fleshy you can eat the stems and the the leaves and it's a relative of purslane the other name for it is surinam purslane surinam purslane water leaf it's got a few other names but talinum fruticosum so just a rundown you know if you want perennial greens uh and if, you, if you're like you find perennial greens inspiring i highly recommend uh, Eric Tonesmeyer's book, Perennial Vegetables. That is a great book. I bought it years ago and, and, and I have enjoyed it. Let's see. Yeah, I bought it in 2012. Back in 2012. I still have my, my Amazon order. I'm, I'm looking at it on Amazon right now. So I bought it in October of 2012. And I put a link below this video to my Amazon, my Amazon link if you're interested in this, this, book because uh, Eric Tonsmeyer has done excellent work and even though his his book is from 2007 he was way ahead of the curve and it's still a decent seller years later you know um, just just cool cool collection uh, over 100 easy, delicious, delicious, easy to grow edibles. It's got all kinds of weird plants in there. You're getting, you, it it, it kind of makes you crazy because you're like, I want to try all of these. You know, you it's not good for plant hoarders. We're all plant hoarders now. Rayboth Farm says, can you eat the Abelmoshes Manahot seed pods like you do okra? I'm not sure. They didn't really make particularly big pods. Uh, ID Prism says, do you know of anybody who does for northern climes what you do for tropical, or will you someday garden in the north? I may someday garden in the north. Lord knows. But, uh, at this point, I mean, if somebody said, we have a, you know, a 100 acre compound protected by former army rangers, and there's a garden in the middle of it, would you come and we'll give it to you? I, I would probably take it. <laughs> okay, check this site out. But in answer to your question, temperate climate permaculture. This guy is, is very good. <clears throat> really good ideas. Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't do all the things that, that they do. And none of us are, are the same. You're, you're not going to find anybody with my unique personality. Temperate climate permaculture's not going to sing to you. He's not going to dress like a pear, like a pear. His sisters probably won't go out in the yard to sell a t-shirt. So watcher, beware, beware. You know, you're not going to get that sort of thing, but that's fine. I, it should, it's, his site is fantastic. Let's see here. Let me go now and talk about these super chats. We'll answer super chats, and then we will call it a night. 
<clears throat> BG sends a five dollar super chat and he says, "What do you think about growing pawpaw? What do you think about?" Okay, no, I'm not gonna do that. It's too weird. Really, this is an adult conversation we're having here. This is for the grown-ups. Grown-ups don't, you know, randomly start singing. Some no, see, they don't. They don't do that. Well, some of them do. Especially ones that have a lot of children. What do I think about growing pawpaw? I think pawpaw is a great idea. Now, the problem is when you say pawpaw, everybody up north thinks you mean Asamina triloba, and everybody down south thinks you mean Carica papaya. Unless you get further south than the region of Carica papaya, and then they think Asamina triloba again. So I'm not sure which one you're talking about. Asamina triloba or Carica papaya. <clears throat> the northern pawpaw is a member of the Anona family, um, and it is not easy to propagate. You have to, you basically grow it from seed, you can graft it, but uh, they're easy to grow from seed. Once you stratify, you have to have fresh seeds, you soak them, stratify them, wait like five months, then plant them, then they come up, but you don't want to transplant them. If you can help it, they don't like to transplant. It's best to grow them right in place in the ground, or if you have to transplant them, grow them in a deep pot, because it takes them sometimes a year to, re to, to recover from transplanting. They do not like it. But I, I'm a big fan of pawpaw. I think it's a really nice uh, sub-canopy tree to add to the food forest, um, because it could take a lot of shade and still fruit, particularly in the warmer warmer ends of the south. But it's it's a it's just a classic North American fruit that is way underutilized and by all reports it's very delicious. I have never had the Asamina triloba fruit. I have had fruit from Asamina pygmaea, but not from triloba. Pygmaea is the is a small native Florida variety of pawpaw, of which there are, I believe, eight different Florida pawpaw varieties. So I like that and I mean it's probably well known at this point that I also like growing Carica papaya, the the papaya tree. Uh, it's just unfortunate that the names have gotten crossed. I've got papaya trees growing all over my garden. I start them from seed and, and often start them right where I want them to grow. Or I just start a whole bunch of them in a flat and then transplant them later. But they, they prefer to grow right at the ground and they grow better that way. <clears throat> Uh, and then I get a super chat here from Ashford, sends a five euro super chat. Hi from Ireland. Hello, Ireland. Love to see Ireland someday. I'd love to spend a lot of time in Europe. If I had a, if I had the chance to, uh, to go to Europe, I would take it. There's, there's just so much, so much history there. And I mean, the gardeners, in France and Holland and England and elsewhere are incredible. Would love to see it. Let's see. Yeah, in the real South, Paw Paw means grandfather. Meemaw. Paw Paw Meemaw. The Paw Paw tree was too hot. The Mama tree was too cold. But but the other porridge was just right. Well, thank you, LK, I appreciate it. Hey, Andy Canada, nice to see you back. Yeah, Anon H is right. The, the book I mentioned, Perennial Vegetables, has a list of extreme cold plants you could try. That is beneath the, uh, beneath this, um, Beneath this video, there is a link to Perennial Vegetables by Eric Tonesmeyer. I highly recommend the book. Very, very good. Hey, Mexico! Joe Serrano sends a super chat from Mexico. Um, Hi, David. When you mention Jamaican sorrel, is that the plant whose leaves look like shamrock leaves with little yellow flowers? Subbed in. Hi from Mexico. Well, Joe, that is a... Um, that is a, a good question. It is... Confusing. The whole thing is confusing. Because when you say sorrel, it could be wood sorrel, which is members of the Oxalis family. It could be the sorrel that grows wild across fields, which is not a member of that family. It's it's got um it's got these leaves like this. 
trying to remember what you call those at the moment. Elliptical, you know, they're like elliptical leaves and they're, they're very tart. And then there's Jamaican sorrel, which has also sour leaves. So the sorrel generally denotes a plant with sour leaves, but they are all over the place. So the, the variety you are thinking of, the leaves look like shamrock with the little yellow flowers. I know those because they, they have spread all over the new world. I don't know where they originally came from. They've been a big problem. They spread all across Florida. Uh, that is Oxalis SPP. That's an Oxalis species. Whereas Jamaican sorrel is uh, Hibiscus sabdariffa. <clears throat> Not related at all, but uh, but you can also eat the oxalis leaves, and those are another good one to throw in salads. They're they're tart. I wouldn't eat a lot of them again because of oxalic acid, which is kind of a tip off oxalis. But um, yeah, that's it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's funny I know, but it really is so. I'm my own papa. <laughs> Marcus Aurelius says, any tips on thinning tobacco seedlings? Their growth is painfully slow. Is that normal? About 20 to 30 seedlings per cup. Yes. Yeah, I just, I just, I sometimes, I often dig them out with a little spoon and then I divide them up and I plant them out. They transplant really, really easily. So if you have a whole cluster of them together, when they divide out and they get about that much space in between them, they grow much faster. When they're right on top of each other, they, they compete a lot. Uh, we need a final song here to end this. By the way, guys, we are almost at 100,000 subscribers on this channel, so thank you all very much. Sabdariffa! Hibiscus Sabdariffa! Yeah. That actually might work as a um, 90 song. Hibiscus Abdariffa Hibiscus Abdariffa That is something good, Travis. That's the best song I've ever played. M Silverhammer says, new subscriber, well, welcome. Condo dweller, I want to grow a few greens in pots this summer on my patio that faces east, southeast, extremely hot, South Florida location. What about Egyptian kale, peppers, other suggestions? Yeah, uh, hot peppers love that, they don't mind. Um, <clears throat> you know, sweet potatoes in pots, you can get plenty of greens out of them. Those are good. Another one is the Cuban oregano. That does really, really well. It's a very nice herb. It's, it has a nice mild flavor. It really works well in, in sautés, stir fries, that kind of thing. Very easy to grow. If you can get longevity spinach, it's very good. Uh, that's a really good like patio green, and it can and it can handle handle the heat. And I mean, if you manage to get from anybody, the Abel, Abel, Moshus, Manahot. There are people passing them around in Florida. If you can get a hold of that, they do really well. Basil will do well. Hi, biscuits. Hi, biscuits. That's something else. I don't know if I know any 
Uh, I don't know if I know any days of the new, but I might be able to pull off something here that I was asked about the other day. <clears throat> Let me see if I could play this out. I am not sure. Now I have to listen to it again. Ugh. Yep, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that song. I'm not going to do that song. Can't do it. We have to do a song to demonetize this stream since we made a few super chats. Anybody have a, a song that will help us demonetize this stream? <laughs> <laughs> My son says, Stairway to Heaven. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> yep, that's what I was going to try. President of the United States of America, Peaches, but I, I have to listen to it again before I play it. Yeah, I cook like a garden. Throw it all together. Yeah, these are some good, good, good options here. Uh, I found that... Um, into peaches, peaches for me. No, I've never heard of nitrogen fixing corn. Hey, I could do the hamster song. That won't even demonetize us. tonight sledgehammer okay that's funny <laughs> any any zap song will definitely demonetize us you, you guys heard me doing the uh the the um you, if you if you're on my instagram at the survival gardener you probably heard me doing song. Here we go. Little Susie don't like hamsters cause they sneak into a room at night. Got a pen under her pillow so she can poke them in the eye, poke them in the eye. Won't let them catch you sleeping. She'll be alert when the hamsters are creeping. Little Johnny loves a hamster named Brian Gives him all his hugs and kisses Sending out the hamster haters and the princess Sink and swim with the fishes Well, snakes all smile and the lizards laugh Brian the hamster's Johnny's little golden cap So sing a song with picket fence, sing a song with pie All my little homeboys poke him in the eye Spin around the wheel Press your face up to the glass Smile with your eyeballs as the pretty hamsters pass. I don't see a carving knife, but they got short tails. Poking knives is a way of life, at least we are not snails. Well, thick was slick, is on a kinky lick, making some shtick over who flicked his pick. But he got nicked by this big dick, cool with tricks, sticks out of commit. I pick up sticks, but they try to throw pies at the multicolored flies, wearing their 
Bitty bitty suits and ties The flies are quick, they know the trick Poke them in the eye 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 I think I'm blowing the mic out, aren't I? I know we're too cool for school You know I take them swimming in my hamster swimming pool So grab your sneakers, teach your hamster how to fly And if he gets rowdy, just poke him in the eye Poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye Poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye Poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye Poke him in the eye, poke him in the eye So, there's another one that I wrote. <clears throat> Thank you, Carolyn. Carolyn loves the 30,000 Years song. I play that one all the time, though. This one is called Dr. Von Brown and Superman Visit the Zoo. I was at the zoo the other day and I saw two of my friends Dr. Von Brown and Superman were there walking arm in arm Stopped by the giraffes and Dr. Von Brown said if I had made those things I would have put red lights on the top of their heads Superman paused at this and said, Why, because of airplanes? Dr. Von Brown said, Nah, just because. Dr. Von Brown and Superman visit the zoo. Dr. Von Brown and Superman visit the zoo. The ultimate green. Yeah, John, that is a good, good, good one. No, I have not seen any. It would be, it would be very interesting to know of a nitrogen fixing corn. It is really, that would be really cool. Hey, Savannah. Well, guys. I'm going to let you all go. Have a great rest of the day. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do a stream 
probably won't be able to do a stream tomorrow because I'm I'm helping a friend do some construction work and so I'm gonna be probably tied up all day I'm not gonna be in the office I don't know about Friday either but I know you guys have lots of gardening to do if you could avoid heat stroke <laughs> Have a great rest of the day. I, I want to thank you all for the the super chats. Those of you that sent super chats today, um, Joe and Ash, BG, Betty, and Chip, with a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then Betty with a seven, eight, nine. That was pretty cool. And uh, I, I hope this was helpful. I hope you've got some good, interesting ideas out of the perennial vegetables. I love them. They're so much fun to grow. Plant stuff, stick it in your landscaping. You've got the vegetables for years and years and you know go go get eric tonesmeyer's book perennial vegetables really good i put a link below this video but if you don't want to use that link because you don't want to give me the the amazon percentage it's like i, I get like a couple percent kickback I'm, i don't remember what it is but it's like um just go buy it somewhere because it's really good okay because I've, I've had that book for eight years and it's one of those books you find yourself going back to again and again and looking at all the perennial vegetables and going, oh, that would be fun to do, you know. <laughs> all right. Well, you have a great rest of the night. Thank you to the members. Thank you to the bears that showed up tonight. And God bless you all. Until next time, may your thumbs always be green. <laughs>